Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Trevor. I'm a grad student in Dr. Lowe's lab. Um, he presented a little bit earlier. So this is kind of almost um, a little bit extra to what Talissa and Hannah were talking about. Um, a little bit more on the uh, health health side. So just as a little bit of a background on the Salton Sea. So they covered kind of the ecological part of the Salton Sea, but just a little bit of background on the health issues that are facing the um, people of the Salton Sea. Um, they have very high rates of asthma. Uh, so the rates of childhood asthma are estimated about 20 to 22.4%. Um, there's not a ton of good epidemiological data coming out of the region at this point, but um, that's what the current estimates lie at. Uh, for comparison, the national average is 8.8%, so it's almost three times the national average, and the California average is around 14%, so it's about 50% more than even the California average. In addition to these high rates of asthma, um, they also have very frequent ER visits um, for asthma. So the, the communities surrounding the Salton Sea um, are about in the 75th or higher percentiles um, as far as asthma visits or ER visits for asthma um, in the state of California. Additionally, there are also high levels of particulate matter um, with the Coachella Valley and Imperial counties being declared non-attainment areas for PM10 and PM2.5. Uh, that means that they don't meet the guidelines for air health quality um, for either particulate matter um, between 2.5 and 10 microns or under 2.5 microns. And as it was pointed out previously, uh, the dust levels are likely to get even worse because of how the sea is rapidly drying. So that leads into our question of what actual health effects does this dust have? So Hannah and Talissa went over the collection process for the dust, but before we expose this, both these mice, we fill, we wash the, the dust and filter it. So we're only getting whatever is um, actually able to be dissolved on the dust rather than the larger particles themselves. Then we expose mice in sealed environmental in a sealed environmental chamber um, for either 48 hours or seven days and uh, determine what kind of inflammation um, is ongoing. So when we exposed mice to dust from Worcester, uh, Hannah had a nice map of that, but essentially Worcester is down located in this region. Um, we found that the that neutrophils were highly recruited into the airways. So this graph here um, is a representation of the percentage of immune cells inside of the airways. Um, that are neutrophils. Um, generally, this should be zero. You shouldn't have any real neutrophils in your um, lungs, in your, in your airways. But as we can see here, they make up the majority of the immune cells um, at uh, 48 hours. And while this goes down by seven days, uh, they still have neutrophil um, recruitment. Um, compared to a, this is kind of the opposite of what you would expect based if it was um, more similar to an allergic type of response. Um, Alternaria is a fungal allergen and kind of serves as our positive control um, for an allergic exposure. And as you can see, for, the, for an allergic exposure, you'd expect a lower, um, lower uh, weaker response at 48 hours that gets uh, more strong over time as the T cell immune response develops. And importantly, this also includes eosinophils, um, a large increase in eosinophils, which is a marker of allergic asthma, which we just don't see in the uh, Worcester dust exposed. So our gene, uh, we also took gene expression data from whole lung tissue in order to get a better idea of what's happening um, at the uh, very small um, scale at the cellular level. And we found that it's consistent with what we were seeing at the macro scale um, in that uh, it was it looked like basically uh, an innate immune response with neutrophil and monocyte recruitment chemokines um, and IL-1 driven inflammation. Uh, notably, 
at 48 hours, the magnitude, so the log twofold change, was generally higher than what we saw at seven days, indicating that um, the earlier time point seems to be uh, stronger. So we had several other locations that we tested. Um, we had Sunny Bono, which is uh, located down here, uh, Dos Palmas, which is located up over to the northeast of the Salton Sea, and then Boy Deep Canyon, which uh, is sequestered away and not in, and doesn't get the same uh, dust that is involved with the Salton Sea. So what we found was that the locations nearby the Salton Sea, um, also um, at these different sites, also had an increase in neutrophils at 48 hours, um, just like what we saw with the Worcester dust, while the Boy Deep Canyon, the sequestered away one, only had or did not get any sort of increase, a significant increase in cell recruitment. Um, so it seems to be uh, only that the dust collected from nearby the Salton Sea is leading to this poor health outcome. So this is basically a PCA of all of the different in, uh, exposures that we've done, the uh, microbial toxins and the dust exposures. So the closer the two points are on this, the more similar their overall gene expression profile, or, profile is. So there's a clear demarcation between the, the controls and the exposed. However, the exposed all kind of group together without any clear separation, um, which is a strong hint that we may be uh, looking at similar mechanisms for the inflammation that happens in the dust exposure and the um, inflammation that happens with microbial toxins. Um, so our next step is that we need to confirm this and figure out what if these signaling pathways and receptors um, are involved like, um, it, like we think they might be, and then see how this may play into um, the overall rates of asthma, um, as this does not seem to be a traditional allergic response, um, but it may still play, it may still cause airway hyperactivity um, in a different way. And that's, that's all I had.